Welcome back to our MPI tutorial. So now we continue with the second part, um, which goes beyond the point-to-point -point communications. I'm going to tell you something about so-called collective operations in MPI. So what is a collective operation? Uh, this, so the communication operations that we that I told you in the morning. They were all point to point, which means that they always involve two processes. So one process is a sender, another process is a receiver of the data. And they are point to point since they just link two points in the communication graph. Uh, but also, uh, MPA provides a different kind of operations. These are so called collective operations, and, and they involve all ranks in a given communicator or in a given context at the same time. So that means that uh, all ranks in the communicator m should participate in this operation, so which basically means that they should have to call, to make the same MPI call, and then uh, after all processes have done that, only then the operation succeeds. Uh, and also there is a, if you have a multi-threaded application, uh, this is important, that there is only one call per rank. So if you have a multi-threaded application, that only one thread should make the call, not all threads. So a, a, a multi-thread application is, si is treated as a single MPI rank. So MPI doesn't uh, know anything about threaded applications. So MPI works with processes. So it doesn't care if the process is single-threaded or multi-threaded. <coughs> um, okay, so these collective operations, some of them are globally synchronous, which means that um, if you make a call, the, the call blocks until all other processes have made the call. And there is a point in time where all processes in the communicator are in, in, in the same MPI call. That means that it's uh, globally synchronous. So it, it synchronizes the execution of uh, all processes. So there are some of those collective operations are uh, synchronous, but most of them are not uh, for the sake of uh, performance. Because if you allow uh, the standard allow for some ranks to exit early uh, from those uh, operations, which means that, for example, if, if the the job that the process has in the global in the collective co communication, if it's done and the process no longer needs to wait for it to complete in other processes, then it could just exit and continue. So the standard allows for uh, such behavior, and it's usually what's implemented uh, in, in most MP implementations, just for the sake of uh, uh, reducing the waiting time of the processes. So the, those collective operations, they are basically convenience operations. Uh, you can implement them using point-to-point uh, -point operations, and that's how they, they are usually implemented behind the scenes. But what they do is uh, they implement usually uh, used algorithms so that you do not have to implement them on your own. And uh, also the, the collective operations, they are usually tuned for uh, maximum performance on the hardware. So, for example, they might take advantage of the specific hierarchy of the machine, or they might use some hardware acceleration to do the, the stuff. So, the first and the simplest uh, such collective operation, this is the barrier synchronization, uh, MPA barrier. You just provide uh, the communicator, and the processes block until all other processes in the same communicator has called MPI barrier. So you have this uh, timeline here. Here is the, the 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 rank, and then this rank enters the barrier, so it makes the call at uh, this time TS zero. Then this one makes a TS one, and so on. And then the call exits at that time. So what MPA guarantees you is that the maximum of the entry time, so that in this case this will be TS one, is less than the minimum of the exit time. So in this case this is here. So it means that there is some time. So this TS one here and is less than TE1, which means that there is a point in time, like here, where all processes are inside MPA barrier. So then you know that each process has reached a certain line, and namely the line where the MPA barrier call is. So th th that synchronizes your programs. So uh, you can, um, okay, so this is another, uh, another collective operation. So do you have any idea how you can implement a barrier using uh, send and receive? Anyone? Ideas? Yeah, but then only one process will know that all the other processes uh, have been synchronized. Ah, yeah, uh, yeah, th that's one possible solution. It's usually implemented as a ring, so one process sends a message and it circles, because otherwise you have to send n square 
So it, it grows, uh, the complexity grows with square the number of the processes. It's just linear complexity. You just send one message and let it circle. So each rank sends to the next one. And when the first rank receives the message that it has sent, it means that the message has made a full circle. And then it's synchronized. OK, so another uh, very commonly used operation is the broadcast. So you have one process which holds some data. And then you want to broadcast this data to all other processes. Uh, so this is called the broadcast operation. Um, the process that holds the data initially is called the root of the operation because there is one process which is the source of the, of the information and all the other processes are non-roots. So here is how you can implement uh, broadcast uh, using uh, send and receive. So you basically provide the data, the count and so on. And then you can uh, query for the number of processes and the rank of the current process and then you can compare if the current process rank equals the rank of the root so you, you just provide here the root rank and then if, if this is the root process it just loops over all uh, of the from zero to non prox and then it sends a message to everyone except to itself because it already has the data it doesn't have to send the data to itself otherwise if this is another process which is not the root it just receives the message it's very simple. Uh, this is uh, uh, actually a very simple implementation of the broadcast. The problem with this implementation is that it's linear. So the complexity grows linearly with the number of processes. So if you have a, a very big machine, it doesn't scale. So the, the broadcast will take a lot of time. So there are dip more clever ways to do the broadcast. But this, is, this gives you an idea what a what broadcast is. It's basically just one process sending data to all other processes. And the other processes just receiving the data. OK, so this is how you can implement uh, the broadcast using uh, send and receive. Well, MPI provides you a call which does the same thing, uh, but way more efficiently. So this is MPI broadcast, or Bcast. Uh, you have to provide the data. You have to provide the, the, the size of the, 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 the buffer, the buffer, and then provide the data type and the root. So the root is the rank of the process who is sending the data. And then you provide the communicator. So this must be called by all processes in the communicator. So if you if you use MPI com world for example as a communicator, you have to all processes have to call uh, MPI broadcast. And then this data argument here, it is an input argument in the process which has the rank which is equal to root, and it is an output argument in all other cases because in the root this is it it shows where the data is taken from. And in the other processes, it shows where the data should be written to. And then, uh, of course, you have the number of data elements and the data type. So this repeats many times in MPI, as I said, this triplet here. And then this is the root rank. And then all ranks, ranks must specify the same root because this is very... MPI uses this number to, to determine from which process to expect data. So if one process specifies a different root, the operation will not complete because the so process will just hang. OK, so then uh, this is the root data, yes. And then, um, of course, you have it's a, it's a, it's a collective operation. So in, with collective operations, we can drive, uh, we can draw diagrams like this one. So for this is uh, initially the, the data buffer. And these are the ranks here. So initially, you have the ranks. So for let's say that the root is process number 0. So this is the data initially. A and after the broadcast, this data is replicated in uh, all processes. So there are buffers contain the, the data which was initially only at process at rank 0. So this is the broadcast, very simple operation. And then comes a different way to broadcast data. So broadcast sends the same data to all processes. That's why it's broadcast. It's like uh, you st when you have a TV transmitter, it transmits the same TV signal to everyone. But there is a way to actually chop the data into smaller pieces and distribute them uh, in a round-robin fashion. So this is the so-called scatter operation. And with scatter, uh, now we have a, a bit of asymmetry because there is a set of parameters which are only um, which are only makes sense in the root process, namely the send buffer, the send count, and the send data type. So these specify where the data, so the where the big data buffer is located, and then it says that each process, so each other process except the root, uh, should receive. Oh, sorry, 
and the root. So this, this operation uh, even sends the data to the root. So the, the root should send send count. So it should chop the big buffer into uh, pieces, each of which has send count elements of this data type, send type. And then this should be sent to the ranks. Uh, so the first piece goes to rank number zero, the second piece goes to rank number one, and so on. And then uh, the each process also has to specify a receive buffer where the data should be received. And this is the, the second set of arguments. And also it should specify the size of the receive buffer. And it should specify what uh, the data type of the received data type is. And then you have to specify which process is the which process is the, the source of the data. So this root here. And then the communicator, of course. So there are some restrictions in this operation. So thi this one is only significant in uh, the process which has rank equal to a root, which means that in all other processes, those uh, parameters are just ignored. And uh, this other set of parameters here, it's valid in all processes. So that even the root process sends data to itself. Uh, then you have uh, so these data chunks. So they're distributed in order in, in so the order of the, the ranks. So the first chunk goes to rank number zero, the second chunk goes to rank number one, and so on. So the, the root process also sends data to itself. So it, the, the piece of data which corresponds to the rank of the root is also sent to the root process. And then uh, the amount of data which is being sent, so the send count multiplied by the, uh, so to say, the, the amount of data of this data type should be equal to the receive count multiplied by the um, MPI data type here. So because MPI allows you to construct uh, special data types like vector data types or scatter data types or even structures, it could be possible that you, for example, you have a data type, uh, a receive data type, which differs from the send data types. Unfortunately, we do not have time for this uh, to explain this uh, data types. So for now, uh, just keep in mind, so for, for now, you should put the same data type here and there, and therefore the send count and the receive count should be equal because the data types are the same. So the, here is how it works. You have this uh, send buffer, and then you have four processes here. And the send buffer is divided into four pieces of equal size. So the, si the size is send count. And then each process receives one piece. So the first piece goes to process rank 0. The second piece goes to process with rank 1, then to rank 2, and so on. So this is not the size of the buffer. This is the size of the message being sent to each process. So the, the original buffer should be able to deliver send count times the number of ranks in the in the communicator. So some people tend to, to specify here the size of the original buffer and then they get problems because this is multiplied by uh, by the number of processes. In uh, and then also the receive count, of course, should be able to accommodate a message of that size. OK, so that was scatter. It could be used to, di to distribute. So if you have like a big array of data that you want to process with MPI, you, you can use scatter to distribute the array into chunks in uh, the processes. Then each process does something on the chunk. And then you want to collect the data back. So the, the collection back is uh, performed using the MPI gather operation. So it looks similar to MPI scatter. It just has the arguments reversed. So each process specifies its local buffer, so where it stores this small chunk of data, how big it is, and uh, the, the send data type. And then for the process, for the root process, so only in the root process, it has to specify the receive buffer. So this is the big buffer which collects all the chunks in it. And then it has to specify how many uh, items it receives from each process. So this receive count here is then multiplied by the number of ranks and then you get the size of the receive buffer. And then, of course, you specify the root and the communicator. So the, the same rules apply. You have to specify the same root everywhere and the same communicator. And the receive buffer must be large enough to hold receive count times the number of ranks. And then the same thing applies for the uh, data types. So for this receive count should be equal to the send count if both data types are the same. And because now we only work with the you cannot still construct derived data types, so you should basically 
use the same send and receive count. Okay, so this is how it works. Initially, the send buffer in each process, the th those small chunks, you make the getter, and then at at this rank, which is root the root rank, you get the collection of all chunks uh, concatenated. That is basically the, the reverse operation of the, the scatter. Okay, so there are so-called rootless operations in MPI, which uh, do the same, like getter, for example. But in this case, uh, the getter is not performed at a single process, so not at uh, some special designated root process, but by all processes. So the data is, each process basically broadcasts its chunk to all other processes, and then they, they gather the data. So it's it's the same. It it works almost the same as if the uh, you you make a, uh, you first call MPI gather and then the the root process makes a broadcast of the data, but it's more efficient because there could be some optimizations done in between. So here is how it works. So you have this uh, chunks here, and then all processes have the the big chunk constructed in them. And then there is a combination of scatter and gather, uh, which is called all to all. So all to all is an um, operation where each rank holds a piece of a big chunk of data, and then this big chunk is divided into pieces, and then those pieces are broadcasted. So this works like scatter, but then uh, the way the pieces are gathered is like this. Maybe I should show you the diagram. So here is the, the, the buffer in the first process, this is the buffer in the second trunk, and the buffer in the third and the fourth. So what basically happens is that this buffer here is split into four chunks, because you have four processes, and then those chunks are distributed as if it has been scattered. Then the second, the buffer in the second process is also scattered, and the chunks are appended to, to what has been received from the previous rank. And then the third rank is also scattered, so it's like a transposition of chunks. So you have this uh, matrix here. Of this is like a ch chunk matrix where each element is a chunk. And then this matrix is transposed. It's uh, called chunk transpose, basically. Global chunk transpose. Uh, so the order of, the re of, the f of which the, the these pieces are put one after another is the same as the rank of the processes who send them. So the, the chunks which come from the first, from zero rank zero, go in position zero. Then the chunks that come from rank one go in position one, and so on. So this is like a combination of scatter and gather, but a bit more complex. So here, in the previous operation, you don't have a root, because this is an operation where everybody sends data and everybody receives data. So there is no special process which sends or special process that receives the data. OK, so again. All processes must call the same uh, collective operation, so must make the same collective call. And uh, if you have multiple collective operations, so for example, if you call broadcast and then you call scatter and then you call together, the order of the operations should be the same in all ranks. So you cannot, um, for example, start a broadcast in one process, a gather in the other, and then gather in the first one and, and broadcast in the second. So the order of the, the collective operations should be the same in all ranks. And then um, there is something like collective operations, they are kind of isolated. So you point-to-point uh, -point operations, they cannot see the traffic or the data which has been sent by the collective operations. So you cannot have one process doing scatter and then the message that it sends to another process being received by MPI receive. This won't work. You cannot receive with MPI receive messages that has been sent by scatter. You have to use scatter in the receiver. The same goes for the for the gather. You cannot send a message with MPI send and then collect it somehow with MPI gather. You have to use MPI gather both at the sender and the receiver of the data. Okay, so uh, some of the advantages is that, uh, so these are, uh, these collective operations, they are very commonly used, so there are many more that I just cannot, uh, don't have enough time to show you all of the uh, collective operations that are available in, op in MPI, but you can look them in the standard. Uh, so this, these are all very commonly used patterns in single SPMD uh, programming. And then um, the implementation could be, so the implementer of a certain uh, MPI 
library can throw in some some very specific optimizations to, to make it faster. So for example, this is the broadcast operation and the implementation that you uh, have seen the source code is basically that. So one process just sends a message to each one, each other rank in succession. So this is the NIF implementation. In this case, it takes like five, uh, five units of time. So there is another implementation. For example, one rank can send to uh, to the those those rank, and then it can send to this and this one and this one. So it it can use some kind of a tree distribution, so like binary tree or some other or some other kind of tree. And then you get shorter. So th this operation runs in like three time units. But there is even more um, uh, genius operation. This is the so-called uh, pipeline. So where one rank sends, splits the message into many tiny pieces and then sends the first message to f first piece to the first rank. And then it passes it to the next rank and to the next rank. And then the data flows from the first to the last rank. And then uh, there is only a little bit of startup time and end time, and then in the middle, so for for very large messages, it basically achieves constant time. So it doesn't matter how many ranks you have; the broadcast completes for almost the same time. Okay, so there is another operation which is called a reduction. So a reduction performs operation over data which is distributed. So for example, you have. Uh, for example, let's imagine that you have uh, 10 processes, so 10 ranks, and each one of them holds one integer value. And then you want to make a s the s to take the sum of those integer values, so the product or whatever. So MPI reduce is what you have to use. In MPI reduce, uh, so it basically performs this kind of operation. So th there is it's a rooted operation. So there is a, pro uh, a one process which is the root, so where the data, uh, the, the result of the operation goes, and then each process supplies the send buffer and then the receive buffer, which is only valid in the root in the root process, and then the count. So in this case, the send buffer and the receive buffer are of the same size because uh, MPI reduce performs an element-wise operation, which means that if you have a if you if you send data is like an array of ten elements, after you perform the reduction, you will get an array of ten elements again, and then each element of the receive buffer is basically the content of the send buffer in process with rank zero, and then the operation, and then the send buffer in process rank one, and then the operation, and then the buffer in in the last rank, and then this is the index. So this is like a loop. So it loops over each element of the array, and performs this uh, this kind of operation. You could think this of a as a vector operation. So you basically take a vector of uh, in the send count, so th the send buffer, and then this vector element-wise is combined with another vector from the second rank, and then it's combined element-wise with another vector from the third rank, and so on. So here, the you have to provide a handle to an operation. So this, uh, those operations that can be applied, uh, MPI uh, uses the so-called operation handles, and then you have to, to supply the handle for this operation. And MPI provides uh, some predefined operations, which are all commutative, which means that um, they commute. So A operation B is equal to B operation A. And then uh, they're also associative, which means that A operation B operation C could be either treated as A operation B and then operation C, or A operation B operation C. So that's, uh, it some improves the, the way that uh, the, the operations can be uh, implemented. So you should be aware that um, for example, if you use non non commutative uh, mat mathematics like using floating point operations, they could be non commutative, and then reducing the, the the results could depend, for example, on how the numbers are distributed uh, along the ranks. But this is, I mean, this is standard problem with uh, when dealing with floating point numbers. So I, I everyone who is into scientific computing should be aware of these uh, possible things, which means that if you have a serial program and it gives you a result 5, and then you make this program parallel, and you run it, and it doesn't give you 5, it gives you 4.9997. So this is nothing bad, it's just how it works. So uh, then there's a, a lot of predefined operations in MPI, for example, MPI max, for finding the maximum element in, uh, from all ranks. 
MPM mean for minimum sum, sum performs the sum, the summation prod, prod for the product. Uh, there are some logical operations like logical and boolean and and so on. Also, you can register your own operation. Uh, so you can write a function which uh, does something on the data and then you can uh, register this as a function like oper um, as a um, reduction opera operator and then you can use this uh, in MPA uh, reduce. So for now you don't need to write your own. Uh, the one that MPA provides should be su sufficient. There is a all version of this, so rootless version. It's all reduced. You, the difference the di is that there is no rank, uh, root here, so all processes receive the result of the reduction. It's the same as MPI reduce com combined with broadcast afterwards, but it's more efficient. Uh, okay, so when you register your own operation, there are commutative, and you can say that it's non commutative, which means that the order of evaluation should be uh, fixed. And in that case, uh, it could be a bit slower, but uh, this does not affect you yet. Okay, so there are different um, versions of this collective operation. So for example, gather and scatter, and uh, all gather and all to all, they all work with chunks of the same size. So what happens if, uh, for example, the size of the your big buffer is not divisible by the number of ranks? Well, then you can either give an error and uh, say I'm not going to work in this case, or you can use the so-called uh, variable length versions, getter v, scatter v, all getter v, and all to all v. So those allow you to, s to specify exactly how many elements should go to each of the ranks. And then you can, uh, you can use an even subdivision. And then there are some additional operations like scan and reduce scatter, reduce scatter block, and so on. So if you if you need one of these, you can just look it into the standard what it does, and then uh, look at the manual page and so on. Okay, so are there any questions about the collective operations? No. That's okay. Then you continue with the communicators. <coughs> so as I said, um, every communication in MPA happens in some kind of a context. And th those contexts are called communicators. So a, a communicator is a is like a, a context which consists of a, a group of processes. So these are the processes uh, which are part of this communicator. And then each communicator can have additional attributes. So one of these attributes is the error handler, which is associated with if an error occurs in that communicator. Uh, should it terminate the program or should it give you back an error code? So this is a property of the communicator. So you, for each communicator, you can uh, change the error handler. And then you can store uh, key value pairs in the communicator. So these key value pairs, they are not global, they are local, but each process can um, store this, those values in the communicator and then every time when this communicator is used somewhere, this those stored key value pairs can be retrieved. So this is usually useful more uh, for libraries, not that much for uh, user applications than for when you write a, a library which uses uh, MPI to distribute data. Um, then you can store some information. So for example, if you make a broadcast and then you compute the optimal distribution of processes, like you build a tree, you can store the tree, the pre-computed tree inside the communicator. So you do not have to recompute it again. Because the communicators, they cannot change in time. So there is, there is a set of processes in this communicator. They remain in this communicator as long as the communicator exists. Then if you pre-compute the tree, it won't change. So it doesn't make sense to pre-compute the same, to, to recompute the same data every time. So you just, you can store the tree inside the communicator. And also each communicator has something which is called topology associated with it. So the topology uh, is uh, like how the processes are organized. So each process has a rank, but MPI allows you to build something which is called a virtual topology. Unfortunately, we do not have time to, to, to I don't have enough time to tell you about virtual topology, but for example, you can have a if you if you have a program which computes on a grid, for example, you, you work on a matrix, you can build a virtual topology, and then each process uh, can receive a set of Cartesian coordinates, like uh, two-dimensional coordinates, 
and then you can use this, for example, to compute the rank of the process which is next on the right, on the top, on the left, on the bottom. So this comes very handy because it allows you to uh, do things which will otherwise require that you write some mathematics. In this case, this comes from MPI. And also, MPI can use this information that you have, um, for example, processes which are, are arranged on a grid, and then it can use this information to distribute those processes in such a way that this matches the hardware um, topology. So it could place processes which are next to each other in the virtual topology. It can place them uh, in such a way on the hardware that there is a fast link between them. The, for example, on the cluster, you have this InfiniBand which connects everyone to everyone, and the path is almost the uh, same length because we have this fat tree topology here. But there are architectures like the Blue Gene, for example, where nodes are organized in a different way, and then sending a message between two processes which are on the same, which are placed on the same board is like faster than sending uh, messages between processes which reside on different uh, compute boards or in different racks. And then this information can be used by the library to place processes in a certain way. So MPI provides you with two predefined contexts. So the first one is MPI com world, which encompasses all processes in the job initially. And then MPI com self, uh, which only contains the, the current process. So you basically have one MPI com world and as many MPI com selves as processes are there in the job. And then when you send a message, the, the unique identificator, so the unique address, is basically the communicator and the rank. Because every process can be a member of many ranks, uh, sorry, of many communicators, and then in each communicator, that process can have different rank. So the rank in COM world might not match the rank that the process has in a different communicator. So for example, uh, this is a communicator and those are the, the, the groups of processes that are in the communicator. And then you can have, uh, okay, this is the process group. Uh, maybe I don't have a diagram, but then you can have, for example, two overlapping communicators, which means that they have, uh, there are processes that belong to uh, both communicators and those processes might have different ranks in, in each communicator. Therefore, the rank itself is not unique uh, addressing point, but rather the communicator and the rank is what is unique. So with MPI com size, you've already seen this uh, call, you can get the, the number of processes in the group of a given communicator. And MPI com rank obtains the rank of the calling process in that communicator. And there is one very special uh, rank which is called um, MPI PROC NULL. So MPI PROC NULL is member of every possible communicator and you can always send a message to MPI com, uh, PROC NULL. What happens is that nothing happens. So this is just a uh, non-operation. You can also receive a message from MPI PROC NULL. So what you receive is a zero-sized message which has a tag of MPI any tag. I mean, th this is useful when you can, um, so that you can if you have corner cases, for example, if you send uh, data in a line and then you have one process which is on the left and then it has no uh, process on the left side and then you have one process which is on the right and it doesn't have um, a neighbor on the right side, what you can usually do is you can do if my rank equals the leftmost rank, then only send, do not receive. Otherwise, if my rank equals the rightmost rank, then only receive. Otherwise, receive and then send. So this is a bit asymmetric. It, it's you have to write a lot of ifs. What you can do is you can write always send and receive, but you can uh, compute when you compute the the rank of the left and the right neighbor. If you are the leftmost, you can just say okay. If I'm the leftmost process, then my left rank neighbor will not be my rank minus one, or will be MPI proc null, and then the code becomes much more symmetric. Okay, so this is the uh, message envelope. So the, the communicator is part of the message envelope. And then it's not possible to send uh, messages across communicators. So there is no way that one process uh, sends a message, for example, to MPI com world, and then a different process receives that message in a different communicator. This doesn't work. So both processes has to be members of MPI com world, and then both the send and the receive operation should address MPI com world. 
So when you make a collective operation, for example, the collective operations, they require that all processes specify the same communicator. Otherwise, it won't work. And then the idea of the communicators is that, like with tax, you can, um, so with tax allow you to color the messages that you sent in a certain communicator, so to differentiate between the messages. Well, having communicators allows you to isolate communications between um, in a completely different channels. And this is uh, very useful if you, if you write a library, so if you write uh, a parallel library, and you want to make sure that no part of the application could interfere with your messages, because, for example, you send messages uh, with the tax, which might be the same as the tax used by the, the application code, then what usually libraries do, they, they duplicate the com world communicator and then use this duplicate communicator because it's a different communicator. It's made from com world, but still it is a completely different context. And they send messages only in this um, duplicate communicator that the, the rest of the program doesn't know anything about it. And that way you prevent uh, mi possible uh, mix up with the messages. So. In this course, you only deal with MPI com, with MPI com world, which uh, makes it very simple, and you only have uh, an addressing scheme, which is basically the, the rank of the process. Okay, so the continue with something about um, mixing MPI with other uh, programming paradigms. So MPI is uh, very abstract, so it specifies only those sent and receive operations. And those send to receive operations can be implemented on many different hardwares. So for example, uh, <coughs> you might have two processes that reside on a shared memory machine, and they might use something like uh, shared memory to, to send the data, maybe map uh, the same block of memory, and then one writes and then the other reads from it. It could be possible. But then you can have processes which are connected by something like InfiniBand, or it might be even connected via internet. MPI doesn't care. As long as process A can talk to process B and to all other processes actually, then you can have MPI mapped on top of this. It might be slow, but it will work. So MPI, because of this sufficient abstraction, MPI basically runs on everything. You can you, ca you have MPI running on, com on clusters, you can have MPI running on supercomputers, on uh, even on things like uh, Intel Mic. There is an MPI implementation which runs on it. And then um, you can also send messages between different architectures. So you can have uh, heterogeneous architectures. So that's why MPI is very, um, very generic, but it might not be the optimal way to program architecture. For example, it might not be the optimal way to program uh, uh, multi-core things like uh, Intel Mic. And there, for example, it might be better to use OpenMP, or if you have a graphical card, so if you have a, uh, ac accelerators in your machine, those accelerators might not be able to run MPI. For example, on, on, on GPU, GPU, usually you don't have uh, MPI implementations. But what you can do, you can mix MPI with this other programming paradigm. So you can, um, for example, this is again the, this uh, thing. So you have the, the CPUs here, you have the memory, and you have the network that connects them. So nothing prevents you from using OpenMP, for example, to program this node here. And then you can only you can use MPI basically to scale beyond a single node. So you start with your serial program, you make it parallel using OpenMP, and then you you are able to utilize all cores in a single node. But then you require more computing power, you have many nodes. So what you do, you just, you can build MPI on top of or your existing uh, OpenMP application and use MPI to, to talk between the nodes. So this approach is called a hybrid approach. And you can also uh, use, combine this with things like uh, OpenCL or CUDA to program the GP GPUs. So this, this is basically the idea. Uh, so M MPI has some support for trading. So while MPI itself uh, does not know anything about threads, I mean, for MPI, as a multi-threaded application and a single-threaded application, so a multi-threaded process and a single-threaded process is treated the same way. It's just one rank. It's just one process of many others. And uh, But still, you can use threads in your application for performing things. And 
because you have threads and because it might happen that you might want to call MPI from different threads, then there are some provisions that you have to make uh, sure of. And MPI provides four different levels of thread support. So they're ordered here in the, le uh, in the increasing uh, in the increase uh, order of the, the value. So MPI thread single is the basic mode, which basi basically means that no support for threading. It means that if you have an MPI library which only supports MPI thread single, there is no way that you can make calls from different threads at the same time. It will basically crash the application. Then comes the so-called MPI thread funnel, which allows you to have a multi-threaded application, but only one thread, so the main thread of the application, can call MPI. So that's why it's called funnel, because all threads has to go through the main thread to send the data. And then you have the so-called serialized uh, level, where you can make calls from different threads, but you have to make sure that no two threads call MPI at the same time. So you have to provide some kind of synchronization or serialization. That's why it's called MPI thread serialized. It's basically if you have a multi-thread application, but then you have a critical um, section around each MPI call. And then comes the most versatile level, which is MPI thread multiple, which means that any thread can make an MPI call at any time. So basically, all MPI implementations support MPI thread single, because this is the, the, the basically MPI was designed. But there are not that many uh, implementations that actually support the full threading uh, level. So if you want to have a multi-threaded application that plays nice with MPI, you should replace the call to MPI unit with the call to MPI init thread. So it's basically the same, except that you provide two more arguments here. So one of them is the, the level that you require from the library, and then it returns you ba the actual support level. So you, you say, I want, for example, MPI thread multiple. The library re replies with, sorry, I only provide MPI thread single. So uh, because the levels are ordered, I mean, th this, this thing, this is a constant that has a, num a numeric value, and the numeric value of this one is lo lo lower than this one, which is lower than this one, and this is the highest. So you can compare them with uh, less than or less than or equal and so on. Uh, and then the provided level could be actually lower than the, the requested level. This is allowed by the standard. It, it won't give you an error. It would just say, I don't provide the level that you want. And then you have to take care of uh, continuing the program in a way which is uh, meaningless, uh, meaningful. Sorry. And then it is also allowed to have uh, that the library actually provides a higher level. It's, not, it's OK because each higher level includes everything from the lower levels. But it's usually slower because, for example, in the fully threaded, uh, the fully threaded uh, level, MPI has to lock some structures when uh, doing the calls, and locking and unlocking the structures could impair the, the performance. So that's why MPI thread single is the default, because it's the most performant uh, level of MPI. So if you only call MPI init instead of MPI init thread, this would be the same as if you have called MPI init thread and said that the required level is MPI thread single. So the library is allowed to actually provide a higher level. And then if you have called, um, so the library, uh, the thread that has made the call to MPI init thread becomes the main thread. So this is important from the MPI thread uh, funnel mode, because in the funnel mode, only the main thread can make the call. And the main thread is the one which has initialized the library. OK, so once you initialize MPI at a certain level, this level cannot be changed. And then, uh, if you have called, for example, MPI init, or if you write a library which uh, uses MPI, uh, you can query the, the level that has been provided, actually, with MPI query thread, and it gives you back the, the, the level that has been provided. So if you use MPI init, then you can call MPI query thread to actually uh, find out what was the default level for that MPI library. And then, you can also use MPI is thread main to find out if the current thread, the thread that makes the call, is the main thread. It just gives you a boolean flag, which is either true or false. So true in the main thread, false in all other threads. Uh, so when it comes to hybrid programming on our uh, cluster, we have um, two implementations. So we have Intel MPI and Open MPI. 
So OpenMPI uh, has to be rebuilt with special flux in order to support multi-trading. So that's why we have usually two modules. So we have uh, like a default OpenMPI, which is like 1.6.5. This is non-multi-traded version. And the multi-traded versions have this MT suffix. So you have to change the library to get support for multi-trading. Uh, Intel MPI, it comes with uh, both traded and, and non-traded versions, so you don't have to load a different module. Uh, so, so the default that we provide is the non-traded one. So there is one uh, warning here. If you want to develop multi-traded applications with OpenMPI, you have to be aware that when you initialize OpenMPI with MPI thread multiple, it does not, uh, so the the, so the very fast performance InfiniBunch module does not work because it's not thread safe, so the library disables the InfiniBunch module, and then all the communication goes over TCP over InfiniBand. And the communication will slow down significantly, and uh, you might wonder why. So this is the reason why. So if you want to, d to develop multi-threaded applications, MPI, you should use Intel MPI and then face the consequences of using Intel MPI. But both libraries work, so if you if you load the non-multi-traded version of OpenMPI, it no matter what kind of level you require, it will always provide you single. The same goes for Intel MPI. If you uh, use the multi-traded version of OpenMPI, it will provide you the level that you want. Uh, so with M Intel MPI, uh, there is an option for the compiler to automatically uh, link with the in Intel MPI library. So if you use Intel compiler, which we have here, uh, you can just specify a command line switch like dash MPI and you automatically get uh, Intel MPI linked with the compiler. Uh, but the also the compiler m watches or the also the, the compiler wrapper, so this MPI, CC and so on, if if it, if the wrapper sees any mention of OpenMP or parallel, so this is the auto parallelizer, or the switch MTMPI, it automatically links with the multi-threaded version of the library. Otherwise, it links with the single-threaded version of the library. Okay, so there are caveats, of course, when you uh, use um, multi-threaded applications. For example, the most uh, except for crashing because you initialized it uh, at the wrong level. Uh, Another thing which is could, can happen is that if you if you're matching a message with the MPI prop, for example, and then if a different thread happens to issue a receive with this which matches the same message that has been propped, it could happen that uh, this thread, the second thread, could steal the message from the first one. So, for example, you have this MPI prop because you want to to see how big the message is, then you want to allocate a buffer, and then you want to issue the receive. It could happen that a second thread, actually posts the receive which matches the same message and it's received in the second thread instead of the first one and then the first one will block. So this could happen. Uh, and then there is the problem because MPI considers each process as having a single rank and if you have a multiple many threads in the rank you cannot address them. So if you want to send a message to thread number 5 in process with rank 6, you have to be creative. So you have to either use tags to tag messages for different tra uh, threads so they do not receive each other messages. Or you can uh, boot, you can duplicate communicators and have one communicator per thread or something like this. So you have to, 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 be, uh, to become a bit creative. Because MPA does not uh, provide any, any way to have each thread to have its own rank. So there was a proposition for the MPA 3.0, but uh, it didn't, uh, did not get accepted. So in general, thread safe MPIs are slower than non-thread safe MPIs because they have to lock uh, and synchronize data. Okay, so don't use open MPI with uh, trading support. Okay, so now uh, there are many other things in MPI that I cannot cover because there is no time. Um, it could require like a whole week for them. Uh, things like user defined MPI data types, this is very uh, useful, and virtual topologies, which are very useful if you're doing uh, work on regular uh, data, like uh, processing matrices. Uh, if you solve partial differential equations, by uh, in uh, this is you usually need virtual topologies just to simplify things. And then there is a uh, provisions for doing parallel I/O. So there in MPI, there is a means to actually read and write. Um, 
collectively data to big files so that each process reads and writes a special chunks of the, uh, the big file. And then there are more exotic topics like dynamic process control. So one MPI job could start another MPI job and then both jobs could, uh, they have their own MPI com models, but they could connect each other and talk and uh, cooperate. Uh, there is also client-server relationship. So you can start one MPI program with MPI run or MPI exec, and then you can start another one with MPI exec, and then both of them could con connect and uh, form like a single MPI application. It's is very exotic. And then you have this so-called one-sided operations where one process can uh, directly uh, put data into the memory of another process without the other process executing a receive. So that's why they're called one-sided. So they're like uh, put and get. It's similar to when you have shared memory when one process can, or one thread can basically poke or put data into the memory of a different thread because they share the memory. In MPI, there is something similar, which is called one-sided operations. Okay, I guess there are no questions for this. <laughs> and then um, I would like to introduce you to some uh, very commonly used parallel patterns. Okay, so the before we start, uh, there is a saying that no parallel program can outrun the sum of its sequential parts. So this is the so-called Amdahl's law, um, which tells you how fast your program can be. I mean, you have a serial program, it performs for, it runs for time t, and then you parallelize this program, and then you run it on a big cluster, and you expect that you get a very good performance for this, but it might happen that it not, it's not the case. So it's a bit of mathematics here, but I guess most of you are mathematicians or physicists. So the, um, if you have a parallel program, it could be roughly divided into two parts, a serial part that you can not parallelize in any way because this part, for example, is reading data from a file or because it's uh, it's just doing something that cannot be parallelized. So this is intrinsically serial parts of the program. And then you have a parallelizable part that you can parallelize uh, absolutely, which means, for example, if you, if you take the parallel part and put it on five processes, it will run five times faster. So this is very, very, very naive idea, but it actually works uh, with uh, a lot of cases. Then the total runtime of the program is basically the, the time in the serial part plus the time of the parallelizable part. So we're still talking about the, the serial program here. And then th there is a serial share, which is basically the time in the serial part. So once you get this thing and you parallelize it, the serial part is there. You cannot remove it. It's intrinsic. You cannot parallelize the serial part. So th there is this serial pa time which remains, and then you have the parallel ti time, so the, the time in the parallelizable part, which is divided by the number of the processes. It's very simple. And then you have something which is called speed up, parallel speed up. So this is the time for the single threaded application but divided by the time for the parallel application. So the parallel application should usually run faster. So you would expect uh, this uh, ratio to be greater than one. That's why it's called speed up. And if you compute it, it's something like n time divided by 1 plus n minus 1 times s. And then you have something which is called a parallel efficiency. So this is the time for the serial application divided by the time for the parallel application multiplied by the number of uh, processes. So if you, this is the efficiency because usually this is a value which is less than 1. So there are very few cases where you can get something which is called super linear speed up and then you can get efficiency which is larger than 100%. But usually what you get is efficiency which is less than 100%. So this thing here me measures if you run your program with n processes in parallel, if they use more CPU time than the serial program or not. So in the ideal case, if you, if you do not have any uh, serial things, in so if your program is 100% parallelizable, which cannot be the case, but if it is, then you can just run it on n processes. Processors it runs n times faster, and it takes t over n time. And then you, if you multiply this, you get that the, the CPU time which is used is the same as the serial case, but it's just divided by a pro n processors, and then the speed you, the program executes faster. But because you have some serial part which is multiplied, so which is distributed and uh, repeated in all processes, then this serial part will make the 
we make here it will multiply by n and then you get that there is a part of CPU time which the, the, the parallel program has in excess compared to the serial program and then there is this efficiency which is less than one and then there is the limit so when you allow the number of processes processors to go to, to infinity then the parallel part disappears because you divide by infinity and it gives you zero and then you, you give you end up with the fact that the time for the execution of the parallel program when on, on infinite number of processors is just the time for the serial program so that's why a parallel program cannot un outrun its serial counterpart and then the speed up in this the, this limiting speed up is basic one over the, the the serial part of the program so if you have a program which has one percent serial in it it means that you cannot achieve speed of more than 100 it doesn't matter if you throw in 1000 or 2 million CPUs you cannot get speed up more than 100 times and then the efficiency it's either one if you don't have serial or it's zero in, in the infinite case okay so y this is usually less than one which means that when you run a parallel program it consumes more CPU time than the serial program this is important if you're paying or if you have a budget for a CPU time for example if you apply for a project and then you when you apply for a project you say I want uh, 2 million core hours and then you run uh, your application you can say oh I have two, 2 million core hours and now I will run my application on 1000 CPUs because I can and it happens that the program when run on 1000 CPUs is actually much slower than if you run on 100 and then you basically lose you waste CPU time so uh, you have to make benchmarks in this case to, to determine which is the best uh, setting for running parallel applications and uh, with op MPI this is a bit more complex than for example with OpenMP because you have to usually to submit jobs to special queues and so on and then it might depend on how the the jobs are distributed am along the, among the cluster so it might not be the case that if you use the same number of CPUs each time you get the, the same speed up so sometimes because when you when you run the program on, on more processors the data size decreases and there might be a case when there is a bump so there is a uh, tipping point when the data becomes so small so the, the, the piece of data which each process processes might become so small that it fits entirely in the cache and then the program starts running much faster and then you get this so-called super linear speedups and then you get efficiency which is larger than one so th this could happen and uh, it's usually the case because when you run on multiple nodes you get more and more memory bandwidth you know? and then if the data fits in the cache then you work with the bandwidth of the cache and the cache is much faster than the main memory as you learned yesterday so that's why sometimes it might happen that a parallel application could have this uh, counterintuitive behavior like super linear speedups okay but there is a problem so when you have a, a parallel application the, the communication itself is overhead because uh, sometimes you have synchronization so this adds to the CO part and sometimes the library so the, the making a, a transmitting a data from point A to point B is not only uh, it doesn't happen not it could not for example data cannot flow faster than the speed of light so there is a limit of the the, the, sp the speed of the data and then because the machines they are with uh, finite dimensions so that this time is not zero and then you also have the communication channel which is of a certain bandwidth so it cannot push data faster than in a certain limit so therefore you have a time to transfer the message from point A to point B and this time uh, it cannot be sped up so you cannot uh, parallelize sending the data because you have a channel which connects to nodes you cannot send so if you have multiple channels that's okay but this is not usually visible for you but even if you have multiple channels they are also for limited bandwidth and then as you add more and more processes in a parallel job you have more messages which means that there is more network latency involved with this so network la latency is the amount of time that it's necessary to transfer the data from one point to another and then you have more CO time so the more the more processes you add the CO part of the program could actually grow and therefore usually you have a maximum of the, of the efficiency so there is this peak with the sweet spot and uh, sometimes you have to do a lot of tweaking to find the sweet spot and then usually you can stick with this sweet spot for the rest of the, the parallel uh, execution of the program 
unfortunately, this is very hard to model, so sometimes you have to really to run your program many times and to find the, the sweet spot. And then the more serial time, less power efficiency. Okay, so with large processes, there is actually possible that after a certain limit, the efficiency dec starts to decrease. And then there could be possible that you can have a parallel application that actually runs slower than the serial part, the serial program. So you, you have a serial program, it runs for one day, and then you parallelize it, and then you run it with 1,000 CPUs, and it runs for two days. So this, this could happen. So here's an example uh, with one application. Uh, no idea what it is, probably. XNS, I don't know, no, maybe PSDNS, it, it doesn't matter, but this is just a typical application. So this is the number of um, processes per node, and then you have a different number of nodes. And then what happens here, for example, is uh, this is the same amount of MPI processes. So you have uh, four nodes with, uh, what's what, with eight processes per node, so this is 32 MPI processes. This is again 32, and it shows you that uh, Actually, the execution time could depend on how the processes are distributed. So this is a memory-intensive program. Therefore, this program executes faster with more memory bandwidth available. So if you cram more processes on the same node, they have to share the memory bandwidth. Therefore, with one process per node, it, it executes faster because there is more memory bandwidth for the, for the data processing. But still, it, no matter how many processes you have per node, you you observe this thing. So this is the, the execution time. It decreases to some point and then starts to increase again. Because here, the overhead from having a communication starts to actually add to the execution time instead of reducing the execution time. So there is this sweet spot. You have to find it by usually running with uh, multiple uh, number of processes. So there is the, uh, the same. Uh, so this thing here keeps I guess this is the same number of processes per node. No, no number of nodes, eight, and this is. Oh, okay, okay. So these are this is th the number of processes is kept the same with different uh, distribution, and this just shows you where the the sweet spots are. So in this case, for example, you have 64 nodes with one process per node, so you have 64 processes in total. And in this case here, you have. Uh, four nodes with eight processes per node, which is 32 processes. Okay, so in this case you have uh, less, uh, more MPI processes, but still you have like two times faster execution. So this case is the same number of processes with different distribution. You can control the distribution. So in with the MPI exec command, you can usually specify how you want the processes to be distributed among the available nodes. And also with the LSF system, you can specify, for example, that you want to have one process per node. So you can you can specify these things. But then, usually, uh, for example, if you submit for a Yara HPC project here, it doesn't matter how many processes you have per node. What we bill you for is the number of nodes time the time it runs. Okay, so that's for us for the uh, parallel efficiency. Now, two very common, uh, so to say, parallel patterns. So like in, uh, in typical software engineering, you have things like patterns, so uh, algorithmic patterns that you can implement with uh, in your program. There are also patterns in parallel programming, and the two most, um, most commonly used are uh, the so-called hellos or ghost cells, and the other one is the master worker, or now known as the controller worker approach. So with the hello, it is used when you have uh, a regular domain, like this one here. So for example, this is a matrix, and you want to solve a partial differential equation which has been discretized over this uh, matrix. And uh, with those successive iterative solvers, for example, at each iteration, they update the value of the of the cell here, for example, by taking the, the value of the previous iteration and the value of the neighbors. So by using some formula like this one, so cell EG equals some function of the previous value and the values of all neighbors. So this introduces a data dependency. So to compute the value of this cell for the next iteration, you need the values of its four neighbors. Okay, so this is the dependency. 
and this dependency is usually represented by something which is called a stencil. So the stencil is the, the pattern of dependency for each cell. In this case, the stencil is basically this uh, cross. It involves this cell and its neighbors. Okay, so you want to, to compute this in parallel. It's very simple, you just have to divide the array in uh, four parts, for example, like here. So you have four processes, each one takes one-fourth of the data. But there is a problem now, because to compute this data here, you need a value which is in a neighboring process, so it's not in the same process, it resides in a different process. So what you have to do is you have to exchange the data, because in MPI that's what you do, you send information to the neighbors, so the, to the processes that actually need it. And then the problem is that it's not only this cell, so you can use MPI send, receive, because this cell here, to compute this cell here, you need the value here. So this process has to send this cell here, and this process has to send the value of this cell to this one here, so that they can compute. But it's not only this one. There are only a lot of, actually, cells here that need data from neighboring cells, so from neighboring uh, processes, like this one here. And in this very simple case, you need like one, two, three, four, five, like ten, uh, ten data exchanges. Of course, this is not meaningful. I mean, if you if you do at every iteration, if you exchange the data, this makes absolutely no sense because it's a lot of data being exchanged, and it's slow. So how is this solved? This is solved by the so-called hellos. So you can note. So you can notice that. Basically, this data here is only necessary at the beginning of the iteration cycle, and it doesn't change because this process here will not update the value here. It does not change, and oh, there's some kind of animation going here. Okay, again, and the same applies here. So these values can be actually transferred at the beginning of the iteration, and they can be transferred once at the beginning of the iteration, and then they can be consulted at any time when necessary. Because this process only needs the values of the previous iteration. Okay, so this is uh, how it's implemented usually. You surround the local piece of data by the so-called hello. So you basically add a layer of, of cells around the, the, the domain, and this hello is populated with data from neighboring processes and then it's used to compute the values of the cells here. It's called a hello because after one iteration its value is not, the values are not updated so they become updated and they, they're just like a shallow copy of the data from the neighboring processes. If you need, if you, the stencil requires uh, for example two neighbors on, on each direction you can have a uh, multi-layered cell, uh, hello, for example, like this one here. You can add additional layer and additional layer. <coughs> and then if the communication is very costly, so for example, if you have a very slow network of, com uh, like, you compute over in internet, for example, or you, you, you link uh, machines with serial cables, then what you can do is you can add a hello to the hello. So you can, you can add a second layer of hello, and then because you have the second layer of hello, then you can compute the values in the hello for the next iteration. And then, uh, so this hello here can be updated with one step using data from the hello from the outside. If you add another layer of hello, then you can use this value to compute, to update the values of the outer hello, and then to update the values of the inner hello. This allows you to only communicate every third step, for example. So the more layers of halo you add, the, the less communication you can do. And then processing the halo could, be, could, could happen to be actually uh, faster than actually communicating. And then there is an op one operation which is called a halo swap, which is basically how you exchange the data between the processes. It's like this one here. Uh, so you, you have this halo regions here, then you add, uh, just for symmetry, you can add the halos on all sides, and then for even for more symmetry, you can add this here. And then you want to basically to copy this data here, here, and then the data which is here, you want to copy it here. And then this thing here, you want to copy here, and this thing here, you want to copy here, and so on. And then if your stencil also requires the elements on the diagonal, you have to copy this one here, 
and this one should come here and so on. So this could be implemented very easily with only two operations, which is called shift. So for example, you can do a shift in one di direction. It's very simple, just each process sends its rightmost data column to the process on the right, and the process on the right stores the data in the hello region here. So this column here has been copied here, and this column here has been copied here. So this is called hello swap, and this could be performed in the same uh, dimension, but on in the other direction. So this data from here ended here, and this column here ended here. Now you can perform the same in the, di in the other dim dimension, like this, and then you can do the same in the other dimension, like this. So this is called a direction one hello swap. And after those operations, you can see that basically the data from here ended here, the data from here ended here, and even the one that was here in the first hello swap ended here, and then because the whole row was sent here, it ended here. It's so if uh, this very simple two operations in each dimension basically also transfers magically the, the elements which are in the corner. And you can do that in as many dimensions as your problem is. You can do that in three dimensions, you can do that in four, if, uh, if you're into, I don't know, uh, computational chromodynamics, you can do this in 11 dimensions. And then uh, those operations are locally synchronous because each process talks to the, to the neighbor on the left and on the right. But when you look at the big picture, because each process depends on the one on the right and on the left. The one on the left also depends on one on the left, which depends on its neighbor on the left. And in the end, you end up with a chain of dependencies. So all processes are interconnected in this case. So they all depend on each other. And it is very important to have the processes synchronized before starting the hello swap operation. Otherwise, it will introduce delays. Um, that's why uh, such kind of operations work best on machines where um, there is no possibility that one process could run faster than the other. For example, on the blue gene, uh, because each process runs, each CPU runs at the same speed, and if your algorithm is like regular, so you, you have the same amount of data, and it takes exactly the same amount of time to process the same amount of data, then the time between the hello swaps is the same everywhere, and this it basically synchronizes very well, very nicely. On the cluster, it's not that actually true because uh, on a cluster you have a full operating system and this full operating system runs some additional processes and these additional processes, they sometimes steal CPU time from your processes and it reduces the so-called operating system jitter. So the jitter is like if you measure the time that it takes for a certain operation it's and if you run this in a loop, Every time you measure, you get a, a bit different. It might be a bit slower, a bit faster. And this uh, this uh, thing is called jitter. And uh, th because the hello swap introduces this global synchronicity, it then it becomes a bit uh, sensitive to uh, jitters. And then these algorithms that implement, that use this kind of hello swaps, they might not perform very well on clusters. I mean, they usually perform well, but they could perform better on, on cluster machines. And with MPI 3.0, there are the so-called non-blocking uh, collective operations, and you can use those to implement uh, hello swaps, uh, which are asynchronous hello swaps, and then uh, you can make it run faster. But with MPI 2 and no MPI 1, it's not possible. So it's very simple to implement. Uh, it only involves two MPI calls in, in each direction. It's basically MPI send receive. You can use MPI send receive to send the whole uh, column of data to the left and to the receive the one to the right. And then you use two MPI send receives per, di per direction. So for two dimensional problem, you have four MPI calls. Um, okay, so the problem is that if processing one element of the array could depend on the value, or for example, could the time, if you, if you have some kind of a loop going in each processing each cell, and if this loop could run for different time depending on the value of the, the cell, then you have a problem. The problem is that because processing takes different time and because the hello swap cannot start before all processes have completed the computation, then it introduces 
this kind of problem that one process has completed its uh, working and it's waiting for the neighboring processes to complete so that it can perform the hello swap and start the next cycle. This is called load imbalance and it's a very big problem in, in uh, parallel computing. And there are many research topics into how to actually get rid of uh, load balance, load imbalance. And the way, for example, the most prominent uh, example of load imbalance problem, this is, for example, computing a fractal. Because it's a very simple operation. You just run an iteration, like uh, you compute a complex series. For example, the Mandelbrot fractal, you start with uh, some values for each uh, s pixel. And then for each pixel, you compute this uh, loop. And then the loop is computed until the num so uh, if until this uh, series becomes unbounded, so you basically compute this thing and you run it until the module of the the complex number is less than two, because the theory shows that if once it becomes more uh, bigger than two, it uh, the, the the series diverge, and then there are points here where this loop never ends because the 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 series bec uh, remain bounded, and there are points where the, the series are not bounded, and the, the border between the bounded and unbounded is this uh, fractal figure here. So this is a very simple algorithm. You just start, and then you run the loop. So what happens is that if you happen to be here, somewhere in the fractal, the loop will run forever. So that's why there is this uh, max iterations, for example, no more than 1,000 iterations. If you run here, it will take just one or two iterations to, to become unbounded. If you run somewhere here, it might take like 100 iterations. The closer you are to the border of the fractal, the more iterations it takes. Therefore, if you just split this thing into, for example, in three parts and distribute those three parts to three different MPI ranks, what will happen is that computing in, because, uh, okay, so if you take the, the time it takes to compute a single column here, and if you plot it, it, is, it has something like this, so it, it looks like this. So here, where you're uh, away from the, the heart of the fractal, it takes almost zero iterations. And then here in the body of the fractal, it takes more and more. And in that part, the fat part of the fractal, it takes a lot of uh, time to compute the, the, the column. So if you divide this into three ranks, what you get is the first rank takes that much time to compute. And then the second rank takes that much, and the third rank takes that much. So the first rank takes 1% of the time which is necessary to compute. The second. 55 and the third one 44 percent. Therefore, if you run this, you have three processes. So two of them do a lot of the job, and one of them does nothing. Therefore, you're wasting 33 percent of the available CPU resources. Okay, you might try a different distribution. Just divide them by that. That way, well, it still doesn't work. So these two work for 8 percent of the, the 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 compute time, and those two here does 42 percent. So this is still not good. What you can do is you can use the so-called controller worker approach, which is sometimes called a, drop, a back of drops. So the idea is that you have one process which takes the big domain, so the, the big, for example, the fractal, and then splits it into many smaller, uh, small pieces, which are colloquially called jobs. And then you have each rank of the remaining worker ranks asking for job from the from the master process so it basically works like this it sends the the work and then it waits and then it receives the results so this send work here is a bit more complex because usually uh, one once this rank here does the job and sends the result it usually asks for another uh, job item so therefore you have a big bag of jobs and each of the the, the worker processes ask for one piece of jo uh, job then the master sends this piece, it's processed, and then it's received back. And then the, if there is more drop, more drop is uh, more work is being sent to the, the worker. Okay? In this case, so this is how it works. You just have uh, the start of the application. Then if the rank is zero, so for example, let's say that rank zero will be the, the, the controller rank, it just splits the domain, so it generates the, the drop items. And then it starts sending data to the, work uh, to the workers. And then receives the results, assembles the result, and outputs the result. Otherwise, if this is the, the worker, it receives a work item, processes, and sends back. Usually, this is a loop here. Uh, it's in this case, it's written like a serial uh, part, but it's usually a loop. So each 
each worker loops until there is some drop uh, item being sent. Okay, so this is how it works with three work processes. Uh, if you if you have three workers, then the one of them uses 35%, the other one uses 65. Not good. Maybe we can increase the number of workers. If you increase the number of or, or if you not increase the number of workers, but you can decrease the the size of the chunks. So for example, uh, we have decreased the size of the chunks here. We get better distribution. So 47, 53. This is close to optimal. What you can do <coughs> is you can increase uh, the the number of job items, which basically reduces the size of the job items. But there is a problem. If you have too many job items, it might become uh, too expensive to send them because sending and receiving introduces some overhead. And then there could be that sending and receiving the data could actually take a lot of time. And processing the data is constant in time because it's the same data being processed. But the smaller the pieces, the more overhead you add. And then it's still, ha again, it has this optimal peak of the performance. The, but the good thing is here that you can actually write an adaptive application. So you can uh, write an application which starts with bigger chunks and then measures how how good the distribution is. If it's bad, it can decrease the chunks. If it's become, or otherwise it could increase, or you can have some very uh, fancy algorithm. This thing also works with dynamic problems. So a dynamic problem is one where you use compute something and the result actually generates more work. For example, adaptive uh, integration. So you start with uh, a grid of certain space, then you integrate a function, and then you start refining the function in the places where the, the, the curve is not uh, smooth. So this generates more work and you can implement this. You cannot implement this, for example, with static distribution, like the one where you have a regular distribution of uh, of the domain among the ranks. Okay, so uh, so these are the comparison of the two um, the two uh, approaches. So with the static approach, it works for regular problems. If you have a regular problem where computing a certain item takes the same time as any other item, it just split the work evenly and this minimizes the amount of communication. It's very simple to implement. Actually, there is nothing to implement uh, except the scatter and gather of the data. But it doesn't work with irregular problems. Or it works but introduces a uh, load imbalance which uh, d very decreases the parallel efficiency. And it's also not suitable for dynamic workspace problems because if the, if the, the domain changes somehow, then th you have to recompute the distribution every time, and maybe you have to distribute the data, and this might be very expensive. Uh, with the controller worker approach, it's uh, it get it's it's very easy to implement, and um, it's very flexible because it can adapt to different kinds of uh, cases, and it has the, the work balancing built in, except that you have to probably uh, tweak the, the size of the job items. But this is something that you can build in the algorithm. And then it also works with dynamic workspaces and it also performs very well on the so-called cluster of heterogeneous systems. So for example, if you have a, um, if you have a big uh, company and you have like 1,000 workspaces, work, uh, workstations, yes, thank you. And there are different workstations and you can use them during the night to compute something. This is the approach that you can use. For example, things like SETI at home, Boeing and so on, they basically implement this approach because you have many clients and each one of them connects to the server and says, hey, give me work. The server gives work. The client computes and returns the work. But this doesn't work if there is data dependency between the items. Because if you have a, if you processing one item depends on processing another specific item, then it introduces this, uh, so the second item cannot be processed before the first one and it introduces a bit of a problem. It only w it, it works very well with independent data items. For example, with a fractal. So computing a fractal doesn't require, so each pixel is computed for itself. It doesn't require data from the neighboring pixels. While, for example, the integrator, the, the, OD, the partial differential equation integrator, there each, each cell depends on the values of the neighboring cells. So you cannot start computing one cell before all neighboring cells has been computed in the previous iteration. So this master worker is not, um, or control worker is not suitable for this kind of problem. 